Greetings, my name is Louise Dente, and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition, we're focusing on 400 years. It is said that it's been 400 years since the first group of enslaved Africans were brought to Jamestown, Virginia. At this time, we are focusing and commemorating that experience, and we're joined by Dr. William Sorrell. Professor Emeritus of African and African Studies at Lehman College. Well, you know, it's so much happening, and certainly um, this year as we kind of reflect on, as we know, people of African ancestry have been here before 1619. But it basically, as enslaved, uh, we say enslaved Africans being brought here by the English in uh, Jamestown, tell us a little bit about that history. In 1619, a ship arrived in Virginia and Jamestown had 20 Africans aboard. They were brought from Africa. They were enslaved uh, en route. But when they arrived in Virginia, there was no slavery established yet. So they became in that category indentured servants. But over a period of time between uh, 1640 and 1660s, laws are being established to enslave Africans, whether they were brought by land or by sea. What would you say, the, uh, how would you describe the conditions that they met? Well, it varied because uh, <clears throat> you had slavery in New England, you had New York, you had Pennsylvania, you had it in Carolinas, uh, in Virginia. Didn't have it in Georgia yet, not until about 1750. And again, the gradual laws are passed in the 1660s. So you have laws such as if a slave raised his hand to defend himself, he could be punished, he could be even executed. Uh, you had laws that if, if slaves ran away, then they could be caught and they could be, have maybe a, a foot cut off. So you have all these uh, atrocious acts that are passed, but everything is gradual because these people don't know how to respond to slavery, the Europeans. And you see many times in the legislation, they'll say, whereas some doubts have arisen. And the doubts are such as if a child was born to an African woman and a European man, what's the status of that child? And so since there's a doubt, they want to close that loophole, then they'll say, oh, the child should be following the mother's condition instead of the father's condition. Or other things such as if a child is baptized, can a baptized African be a, a slave? Again, whereas some doubts have arisen, then they, they say, well, baptism only is going to free the, um, the body from, from the devil. But as far as the uh, rest of the body, <laughs> They're, they're entitled to be enslaved. We think about the aftermath of, that, what, of some of the conditions that we faced in terms of racism and, um, and all the types of things that have actually revisited us to this very day. So when people, uh, when we think about some of the things that happened after enslavement, and for the, clar the clarification for those out there, talk to us a bit about the, uh, again, in New York, when New York uh, people were and were not, slavery ended here in New York as well as in, uh, in the, for the country as a whole. Well, again, it's, it varies because New England uh, had laws getting rid of slavery uh, in the 1780s. Uh, New York is 1827. Uh, the rest of the country uh, is 18, technically 1863 and areas under rebellion, but officially with the 13th Amendment, 1865. Mm-hmm. And certainly when we think about the fact that we're still fighting for our human rights at this very day, and also the fact that even after we were, quote unquote, physically uh, free, um, we've been also dealing with the enslavement of, like you said, there's a term that you've used in terms of the enslavement of the white mind and the black mind. Tell us about how these conditions created enslavement of the white mind and the black mind. What is that? Well, slavery was practiced uh, only by 25% uh, of the, the white population. Everybody could not afford to buy somebody. Very expensive. So people would buy, on, like today, like buying a car or a house, installment plans. So very few white people had the means to own even one person. So consequently, how do you maintain control? And particularly like South Carolina and other parts of the South, the Africans outnumber Europeans for a time period. So one way to enslave the European mind is to make them feel invested in the concept of slavery. How do you do that? Well, you say, 
slavery is for Africans, why Africans are inferior. Uh, white is a color or the badge of freedom. So a poor white is always thinking about the possibility one day I may have enough money to buy one or more. And so that's a way to control uh, white people to help them to participate in maintaining control over the Africans. So you have poor white people out patrolling, say, the riverways or the roadways, looking out for run runaways. And so over a period of time, uh, the white mind gets enslaved because they, they're constantly told you are superior to the African person. And therefore, things can happen that would be harmful, actually, in the long run to white people without them realizing this. And you have this today. A lot of white people are opposed to black people getting welfare, not realizing that more white people get welfare in terms of numbers. Or they're opposed to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> a free public education for all people. And so they want schools segregated because they want to feel superior, not realizing their schools are inferior compared to schools in other parts of the country. So, so their minds get enslaved. Uh, every time you had efforts to bring together the workers, say, into a union, to say, go against the, the ownership, go against the bosses, uh, whether they're factories or farms, uh, when white people say, yes, that sounds logical, someone comes around and say, hey, that man is your inferior. And so then they back off. So in that respect, uh, their minds are being enslaved without realizing what's going on. So when you, we think about that, and of course we know the impact of enslavement on the mental, spiritual uh, predicament of people of African ancestry, mm -hmm. obviously, when you talk about the impact of white superiority sure. for hundreds of years. How did that impact us, those of African ancestry, in terms of enslaving, even after we were released physically from slavery? Well, I mean, again, you go back to slavery, how do you maintain control over the Africans if they outnumber you on the plantation, for an example? And you try to convince them over a time period, uh, it's God's will that you are in this predicament. And they use the curse in the Bible where uh, there's a curse, uh, we call it the curse of Canaan, and uh, try to say the way to overcome this curse is to be faithful to your master, your owners because then you get rewarded one day in heaven. So people could believe this, and th even to the point, like 1892, when you had the, the anniversary of Columbus' arrival in what they call the New World, the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church praised this, saying Columbus brought us here out of a heathen state to expose us to Christianity and civilization, so now we must return to Africa in order to bring our African brothers out of heathenism. I mean, that's, that's mind control. And a lot of us may not realize it, but we sometimes on different levels feel inferior to white people. Now, maybe not in sports <laughs> or, or you know, other things, but you think about it, uh, if you feel that you need a white lawyer or a doctor or a uh, certified public accountant or a dentist because they're, they're white, or you don't think your black brother or sister is competent, uh, that's mind control. Now, you may not think about it that way, but uh, if, you, if you say, oh, I hired the brother to fix, my, uh, fix something in my house, a, a leak, and he messed up, well, maybe the white man messed up too, but you find another white man. <laughs> Whereas in this case, you say, oh, I gave the brother a chance now. I'm going back to the, to the white guy now. See, that's mind control again. Well, keep in mind that Dr. Carter G. Woodson said, and he himself was a Harvard graduate, PhD, he said Harvard ruined more Negroes than whiskey. <laughs> because what Harvard did to them was it imposed upon them a white mindset in terms of who is superior, uh, who do you talk about in the classroom? White scientists. Whose books do you read? White historians. What examples do you have? white, white, white. And so you begin to think to yourself, well, uh, maybe I should try to be white in whatever ways I can be, intellectually or otherwise. And that's why in 1926, when Langston Hughes wrote that essay, uh, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain, he said, it's time for us to throw off these controls. Stop imitating white art. You know, be our own individual selves. And that was a rather important uh, observation because 
Without it, we wouldn't have the jazz, we wouldn't have the blues, we wouldn't have the rap music, we wouldn't have any of these art forms that are going away from a European standardized form of what is beauty and what is art. You talked about the fact that, uh, unfortunately, due to being enslaved for so long, that our minds, we began to look up to the images of good versus evil, this good, this, this, that, that white people became the image of what's best and what's perfect, and blacks became not. And we even within ourselves began to look, I know people use this whole term, the white man's ice is colder, you know, mm -hmm. or thinking that somehow that the uh, services from a white person is going to be different. Um, in, in we, well, as we move into the time frame, um, again, we're talking about Reconstruction. First, talk to us about the Reconstruction period in terms of Africans coming out of enslavement, realizing that the, uh, the, 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 the conditions were so toxic with it, we, we were not given opportunities because of racism. We started to build for ourselves. What happened during that time? Uh, Reconstruction is 1865 to uh, 1877, mm -hmm. and for the first time, uh, African American men in the southern states had the right to vote. And not only the right to vote, but also the right to hold elective office, uh, locally as well as in Congress. And so we, we get people be, becoming sheriffs, for example, or justice of the peace, uh, the local state governments, you know, city governments, and then into Congress. And it shows that we had the ability to govern, although historians or later on would, would say we misgovern, and that became an issue up until the 1960s. We began to get a more uh, realistic interpretation of what actually uh, occurred. But also being independent, being somewhat free, we start to build institutions. And that's when we start building, building churches, Baptists and, and African Methodist Episcopal, uh, as well as began to, to uh, create uh, colleges. And, and we also started to have institutions such as banks. Uh, and we had benevolent societies and then you know, fraternities and sororities and e even towns. So we started building towns in places like Oklahoma and Kansas. So we were on the verge of going forward but see, going forward meant progress for us, which meant that it's going to cause resentment from white people. And that's why you always have this violence that, is, that erupts. So we have communities burned down. Uh, we have people who are lynched. Uh, we have, we have um, school teachers. Uh, there's a good example in The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. He talks about this young man who comes back to the South to be a teacher. And He's in the school and he's teaching things he should not teach from a white perspective. And one day, the white superintendent comes to the school and just says, school's closed, just like that. And this teacher disappears. And so Du Bois leaves it up to the reader to speculate what happened to the teacher. Well, he probably got lynched because he was, he was telling them things they should not know from a white perspective, say things about their history, uh, things about themselves in terms of how they can become achievers. So the issue we always face, whether slave or enslaved or semi-free, is how do we deal with white violence? Because white violence is part of white nationalism. And the effort of white nationalism is to make America white. And if not completely white, uh, white dominated. Now, in alignment with what you just said, the fact that, unfortunately, as we started to step out and say, look, we are going to do for self, we're not going to rely on this, we understand that, you know, we started to build, whether it be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we built our own sure. um, successful uh, communities and, and set up our own institutions, and unfortunately, the tragedy of, of these, these, these communities being obliterated and, and stuff, um, or other examples of, of us doing for self. Um, there is a actually another uh, anniversary, actually, this year, 2019, at the time of this taping, happens to be the 100th anniversary of Red Summer. Um, and for those who are not familiar with Red Summer, tell us about what Red Summer was. 
Well, in 1917, the United States joined the war uh, against Germany and her allies. And we had soldiers who were sent to France. Uh, those who fought actually fought in the French army because the American army wanted them to be more like servants, stevedores, but not soldiers in, in the sense of carrying weapons. So they fought for the French. Uh, they received all kinds of medals and you know, applause. And so the war ended you know, in November 1918 time the men come home by ship is 1919. And so in the summer of 1919, they're riots. Now, you can call them riots or you can call them uh, atrocities or you know, violence or terrorism. But the results were the same. The results were uh, men, even some in uniforms, were being attacked. And there were lynchings. The, the difference was, at this time, is men fought back. So you have a very famous uh, letter and the Crises magazine, NAACP, which a Southern woman who would not identify herself by name nor location said, when she read about men in Washington fighting back, she jumped on her bed and she began to beat the pillows half in, in ecstasy and, and half in, you know, in, in sorrow. She said, at last our men fought back. So she was talking about the fact that men did fight back because they knew how to. They had the training in the military and plus, being overseas and being in a different atmosphere, one free of white racism, they felt that they sh should act the way they sh should be as men. So that was a major breakthrough. That was the summer of 1919. Uh, there's a very famous piece of poetry by Claude McKay, If We Must Die. And certainly the viewers can look it up. And basically what Claude McKay said was, uh, if we're like hogs you know, pinned against the wall, waiting to be slaughtered, we have to fight back. So for each blow they give us, try to return, say, a thousand blows. And that, that's militancy. See, that's, that's what they call a new Negro at that time, 1919. And so the new Negro of the 1919 becomes the, you know, the black militant of the 1960s, the Black Panthers, and, and others who were expressing themselves as men fighting back. So that is very key because a lot of people, the picture of us being that kind of docile, turn the other cheek, let them beat up on us uh, mindset has been the picture that, that you don't really see that of, of us actually fighting back, which we did. We fought back during slavery. We fought back afterwards to, to uh, basically in, in pursuit of our own dignity and the protection of our communities. Um, as we really move forward in this conversation, and as, particularly as we take this conversation to the present day. Uh, we now are 400 years into the future, where most, uh, say, our ancestors pr predicted that we would be 400 years. Where are we now? Where do we need to be? Where, in terms of the dream of our ancestors, in terms of freedom, when they got off that boat in 1619, and where we are now in 2020, 2000, I'm saying going into 2020, 2019. Uh, the status quo is many of us are going forward economically, socially, culturally, because we have the means, we have the, the funding. Uh, many of us are not going anywhere. Uh, if they're not going anywhere, then the rest of us can only make minimum progress. And, and we see this today because we see the violence against our young men in the streets because they don't have the jobs. You don't have the jobs and you're out in the streets. If you're out in the streets, uh, you're challenging the police who believe you don't belong on the street corners. And as, as a, a black officer has said in, in uh, I think it was in Detroit during the riots in the 60s, he says, uh, what else do black men have if they don't have the corner? See, they don't have a job. It's hot. You want to go inside. It's 11 o'clock at night. You're on the corner. If all you have is a corner and the police say, move it, where are you going to move to? You don't want to go inside. So that's the threat. So uh, we have to go over that mountain. See, like Langston Hughes, the, the Negro artist in the racial mountain was, you get over the mountain, there's a different horizon. You can see the valley. You can see other things. By seeing other things, you see other possibilities. And so I think, uh, and we say, if, if one of us advance, others need to advance as well. And as long as others are kept behind, then we have that oppression. So, so where's the violence? Some of it is self-inflicted, like in Chicago or in Brooklyn, where we shoot and kill each other because what else are we going to do? 
If I have nothing, then I look down upon myself, I hate myself. If I hate myself, how can I love you? So then I may make you the target. And then all we're doing is what white people want us to do and which they would do given the opportunity. That is to kill us. So what, in terms of where we need to, I mean, we're now in 2019, you stated yourself that there are those doing extremely well, you know, extremely well living the American dream. Unfortunately, a number of people are not at that level yet. Uh, certainly there's more to be done in terms of, um, when you think when people reflect back, they say, well, if Dr. King, if um, some of Stokely Kama or, or, or some of these, uh, our leadership were to actually see us right now, would they be happy with where we're at? And mm. where, how much more do you think we need to be? Uh, need to be? No, I don't think they'd be that happy because their goal was not to uplift some of us. Uh, the goal was to uplift all of us. And if we have leadership and if we're in position of leadership, but we don't show leadership, then we're just there to please uh, the power structure. So, you know, we're in Congress or we're in the mayor's office. And if we don't use the positions that we have. I remember a woman on I was an eyes on the prize. I don't recall her name, but she was in the Maynard Jackson administration. And when he first got elected and uh, back in, the, I guess, the late 70s in, uh, in Atlanta, she was very eloquent. She says, the people put us here not so we can have offices with plush carpets and go to the right cocktail parties and right receptions. They put us here so we can work for them to do things, pass laws, and whatever we need to do to uplift them. So their lives would be better because we were here for four or eight or more years than they were before. Otherwise, bringing some white conservative uh, who might do the same things that we're doing, which is basically not very much. So this responsibility. And uh, sometimes that responsibility is not met because we're part of the status quo. Well, one thing we can go from here is to read. Uh, you mentioned names of people like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Torrey, you know, Martin Luther King, certainly Malcolm X, and you can go back further in the 19th century, is to read because they write, they wrote. And they, in a sense, gave a prescription. It's like a doctor gives you a prescription, but then you drop it in the street, so you don't know what to do. They gave us the prescription over 100 years ago. Uh, we, we get amnesia, we forget about these things. So then those of us who want to do something, sometimes don't know where to start. Where you start is go to the library, start reading. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast and we continue to encourage you to tune in, to write, and to tell a friend. But till next time, Luis Dente saying thank you.
If you would like to support these broadcasts, we encourage you to send contributions to PO Box 300851, Jamaica, New York, 11430. Thank you. Let's welcome Joe Patan. Yeah. 